Welcome to All Games New and Old. I'm David Rodriguez, and today I'm going to be reviewing Mansions of Madness. It is a one to five player cooperative game published by Fantasy Flight Games in 2016. It was designed by Nikki Valens, based on a design by Corey Kineska. And in order to talk about the theme, I brought in a special expert in the matter, and I'll send it over to him. Ah, you've come. Welcome to my inner sanctum. I'm told I'm supposed to tell you about a game, <laughs> Mansions of Madness, where you play as investigators trying to stop the Great Old Ones from arising from their slumber and devouring all of humanity. <laughs> I suppose you think it'll be some sort of practice. But all the practice in the world won't save you, because when the Great Old Ones finally rise from their slumber, they will destroy- Hey honey, it's time to get, take the kids to soccer practice. Oh, uh, yes honey, I'll, uh, I'll be right there, thank you. Alright, I, uh, I have to go, I have to take the kids to soccer practice. My kid's going to be a star, a huge star, I'm telling you. Anyway, go mole rats, yeah, I'll be right back. Or, right, I'll see you next time, bye. Okay, so that's- it's not quite what I was expecting, but he's right. Uh, this game, you are playing investigators, uh, checking out something that's going on in a mansion, usually. Uh, it can be a matter of the, uh, the townsfolk are noticing people are disappearing, or something creepy is happening up at the mansion, or you may have been invited there by someone to figure out who's up to no good in some way or another. Regardless, there will be monsters. This is based on the Cthulhu Mythos by H.P. Lovecraft. So not only will your investigators have to worry about staying alive, they'll have to worry about staying sane as well, as these creatures were not meant for human eyes. Uh, it's a very dark theme. Uh, it is definitely a horror game. It's not actually scary. It's, it's kind of tough for board games to pull that off. But there is a lot of tension involved in this game. <laughs> Alright, so I've set this up using the scenario they recommend as the interest scenario. I have two investigators, in this case it's Wendy Adams and Father Mateo. Now I'm not going to cover every single rule there is. Uh, there's, I want to say there's a lot, but really you just need to know the basics because with this being an app assisted game, it really walks you through a lot of the other things that can happen, so you don't necessarily need to know every rule in the whole book. It's just not really necessary. I'm going to go into some of the actions you can take because that's important and basically just how a turn will typically play out. Now I want to show you the app here. As you can see, hopefully, uh, I have it laid out or it, it tells me to lay it out basically in this way. So I have the board laid out just as the app shows me. Of course, I've got some investigators and a monster on a board. I, I've got myself partially into the first turn just so I could lock this extra tile over here. At first, that was not there. I had uh, Wendy Adams here investigate a doorway, which opened this. It gave me some flavor text and let me know what was going on in that room and where to place things when uh, that room opened. Now, when you first start into the game, you're going to open the app. You're going to pick a scenario you want to play, and what's nice is each one has a time that it'll take to complete it. Usually it takes longer than it says, but it's a good reference. And then it has a difficulty as well. So if you want more of a challenge or a longer game, you can pick something else. This one's relatively easy and relatively short, although it can vary a little bit depending on uh, the specific time you play, I find. Like, it doesn't always play out exactly the same way, which is sort of nice. I don't have to worry too much about spoilers, but I'm not going to reveal too much anyway. A lot of the story beats will remain the same when you play, but the layout, the things that appear, those can all be a little different each time, which is great. So, going into the, the scenario you've picked, it'll then ask you to enter the investigators that are going to be in the game. Uh, so typically you're going to have an, an investigator per person. If you're playing solo, I think it recommends you use at least two investigators. So you'll pick those. It'll then give you a list of items to distribute amongst the investiga investigators however you like. So for Wendy Adams, I gave her the bandages. I gave her the machete. And I gave her the spell Azure Flame. Now the spell comes you'll get a little deck of that spell. And the reason why is because when you cast it, you'll usually have to flip the spell over and it'll have some sort of an effect on you. So the spells are great, they're powerful and useful, 
but they come with a little bit of risk. Something bad could happen to you when you use them. Uh, for Father Mateo over here, I gave him the spell, Arcane Insight, and I gave him the flask, which will help his sanity. Now, they also each have their own individual powers. Um, Wendy Adams can't be stunned or restrained, and Father Mateo can, as an action, um, have another investigator within range, range means within three spaces, uh, will become focused, and you can activate that ability only once per round. They also each have their health and sanity stat. Both of these have a health of six and a sanity of eight, and they have a set of stats over here on the side, which when you have to roll a specific test, like if it's a strength test, she's got a strength of three, so she'd be rolling three dice to see if she can pass the strength test. And that's, that's mainly how the stats work out. It's, it usually has something to do with the amount of dice you roll. They also start with two clue tokens each, and those are gonna be useful when you do roll the dice. Um, you roll eight-sided dice here, and there's three sides that have the elder sign symbol, and when you roll that, that is a success. There's two sides that have the clue symbol, which will deal those clue tokens, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and there's uh, the rest of the sides all have a blank. So when you roll, if you were to get a clue side on the a clue side on the dice, you could then, if you wanted to, spend one of your clue tokens, and you can flip that clue to a success. So it's a way to mitigate some of the luck in the game. You do have to have the clue tokens, and I'll tell you how you can usually require those as, uh, as we go on here. So you basically have two actions each turn. And the actions you can take are you can move, and uh, one move action is two spaces. So you can tell the spaces uh, by the white lines, or basically if you go through a doorway, that's a space. Um, the bigger rooms will have these white lines to divide it up because it's you know such a large area. And then the doorways are pretty obvious. You can't move through the brown walls. There's some other lines that not, they don't show here that are sort of a, a dotted line that you can't necessarily go through. Uh, and you can, you can do these actions twice per turn as well if you want. So if you wanted to use both your actions to move, you could do that if you had to get somewhere fast. There's also the explore action, which is what Wendy did here. Initially, I'm going to borrow this icon for a minute. Initially, there was one of these red explore tokens here. I clicked on that in the app, and I chose to explore, which opened up this room. So that's something you can do. There's also the search action, and that's gonna involve these tokens here with the gold question mark. Now I'll show you something that's kinda cool, because when you enter the room or you set up the room, it'll tell you what all those are, like it might be a, a desk with papers on it or what have you. But if you forget, you can take the app you can click on that icon, and it'll tell you what it is. It'll remind you again, and it doesn't count as an action until you hit that search button. You can see that little symbol, I think, there. It's sort of like a, a downward arrow with a circle around it. That means it actually takes an action. So if uh, Father Mateo, who's in that same space, wanted to use his action to search that, he could do that, and that would just take up an action of his. Okay, another action that you can do is the trade action. So if you're in the same spot as another investigator, you can trade items pretty freely using that action, or you could drop an item on the ground if you wanted someone else to come pick it up, uh, So that, or you could pick up an item that's on the ground. You can also do an interact. So for instance, if you have NPCs on the board, like this gentleman here, I'll try to get him in the view so you can see him a little better. He's a butler in this case. If you wanted to talk with him when you're in the same space as him, you could interact with him. And it'll usually give you some dialogue options, things to ask uh, if you um, want to learn more about what's going on. It may have you roll some, uh, some tests on your stats to see if you can get enough information out of a person. There are component actions. So for instance, if Wendy wanted to use her bandages, um, it says here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that this, is, this requires an action to use, which lets her discard two face down damage and then you discard that card. So some items require an extra action and some don't. Then uh, the one that you will have to do at some point, but hopefully not too much, is the attack action. So if you're in the same room as a monster, we'll put Wendy there just to make it easier here, um, she would then choose to attack that creature. She could. Uh, if she wanted to do something else in the room, she could also uh, choose to evade, but they both work out sort of the same way, so I'll just kind of show you here. So when you want to deal uh, with a monster in some way, you're going to look at the app, and then down at the bottom here, there's a icon that looks like uh, sort of twisted tentacles. 
You click that, the game knows what monsters are out on the board. So in this case, I only have the one, the Hunting Horror. So I'm going to pick that. And it asks if I want to attack or evade. So I'm going to choose um, attack in this case. And it's going to ask how I'm going to attack it. So in this case, she has the machete, which is a bladed weapon. So I'm going to choose that to attack with. You could also uh, attack unarmed if you wanted to, or attack with a spell if you have a good attack spell. Uh, there's also firearms, which you can actually attack from a range of up to three spaces away. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and pick the bladed weapon for her. And it's going to give me a little flavor text and tell me what I need to roll. In this case, it's asking me to roll against her observation, that eyeball symbol. Oops, I just made it go away. But that's okay. So, And then it also said I needed two successes. So in her case, her observation is a four. So she's going to roll four dice. And we see how she'd do here. Okay, so she got her two successes. So she'd be able to hit it. Um, and then you would tell it that you did the damage and it would... It would say either you do the amount of damage based on the number of successes you get, or maybe that plus one. It can vary a little bit. So it's kind of interesting because every time you attack, it may have you roll on a different attribute of yours. It's not always going to be the same thing. Uh, same thing with evade. So if you choose to evade, it doesn't ask you about your weapon, but it'll tell you to roll uh, against a certain attribute, and you'll do that. And that'll allow you to do other things in the room besides just deal with the monster. It seems a little weird that you'd be like shuffling through a drawer when there's a giant monster in the room with you, but I suppose you could do that if you wanted to. So anyway, that's one of your actions uh, as well. Okay, you also may have noticed that on the board, one of the icons here, or one of the tokens, I should say. Uh, it looks just like a pile of stuff, and you can actually use that as a barricade. So if I open that door and I didn't want this creature to come through, you can actually use an action to move that barricade over here and block the door. Uh, the monster does still have a chance to get through, but it is more difficult for it to. So if you're in a tough spot and you can't handle fighting a monster at that time, it's not a bad idea if you have something around to do that. So after everybody, all the investors have done their actions, and I should say that it doesn't really matter what order you do your actions in. Like, there's not a certain player order. So if I wanted Wendy to go first this time and then Father Mateo, next turn I could have Father Mateo go first and then Wendy. It doesn't really matter. You can do it in whatever order you want to. Sometimes it could matter depending on your situation. So when you're done with all your actions, what you're going to do is you're going to go down to this lower corner here. And it's going to ask you if you want to end investigator phase. We're going to go ahead and confirm that. Actually, hold on. Before I go any further, I do want to point out one more thing about the search action. When you search, sometimes it'll come up with a puzzle for you to do inside the app. So there's a lot of different puzzles they have in there. There's a, a logic puzzle where you're uh, putting different symbols in and it'll say, well, you have one in the right spot and you have one that's the right symbol but not in the right spot or what have you. And you have to figure out exactly what uh, set of symbols it's looking for. There's ones where you have a, a, a picture set up in like six different tiles and you have to move the pieces around until they're all in the right order. There's a few others as well. So those are kind of nice. They add a little more uh, thinkiness to this game uh, in the midst of everything else. So uh, let me get back to where I was though. So we're going to end the investigator phase. So I'm going to go ahead and hit confirm. We're ending the investigator phase. Then you get to the mythos phase. That's the scary phase. Okay. So it'll sometimes pick out a certain person to kind of pick on. So in this case, it's, it's sort of attacking Father Mateo. Like something bad is happening to him. So it's possible he'll have to take some horror damage, which I'll talk about soon. But if he rolls against his will skill, which is what that symbol means. If he rolls a success, it means that he will not take that damage. So we would usually roll for that. We're not going to do it here in this case. Uh, then it's going to tell you what the monsters are going to do. So in this case, the hunting horror would move three spaces toward the investigator within range with the lowest strength. So if you have a few that are in the same range, that helps you kind of break the tie and figure out where it goes. If, if it's still a tie, I, the players just decide where it's going to go. And then the monster will attack when it gets to that person. So, we're going to go ahead and say, okay, so the monster in this case would have moved to Wendy here because she is the closest person. Um, so, it would go there. It would then attack her. Let's just go ahead and talk about what happens when you take damage real quick. We'll say the monster manages to attack her, and we'll say it inflicts two physical damage on her. So, what you would do is it would tell you to take some of these wound cards. 
this case it'd be two. Now it might just tell you to take them, in which case you're going to have them face up. And they may have something that uh, that sticks with you that you keep face up the whole time. It may have something that you resolve right away. And in that case, you would flip the cards over if, if you resolve it and then it's done. But you'd keep that near her. I'm going to kind of cover her up a little bit there. All right, so you keep those near her. And if she ever takes her full amount of physical damage she can handle, in her case it's six, what would then happen is she would clear out all of those wound cards she would take this wounded status, and that would affect her for the rest of the game. Now, if she takes her six wounds again, that would actually kill her. And if an investigator dies, you then have one more round to complete the scenario. And if you can't do that, then you've lost the game. So, in this case, we've had the monster do two wounds to her. That's how that would play out. So... We're gonna go ahead and move on here. I'm gonna say there was no investigators in range just to make it easier. Then it's gonna say that each investigator has to resolve a horror check against the monster within range with the highest horror ratings. So in this case, we only have the one monster. So we're gonna pick, pick that monster. We're gonna confirm and it's gonna tell us what we need to do to handle this horror check. So in this case, both players would have to roll a will check and then get two successes. So if they were to fail, they would get two horror and become dazed. I'm not gonna go into all the status effects right now, but the two horror works just like the wounds. You have these horror cards here and you would take two of them. It, if it just says take them, you put them face up and do whatever it says. If it's something that stays with you, you keep it face up. If not, you'll turn it face down. Now, just like with the, the wounds, if you max out, of your um, your sanity threshold with their with your horror cards, you will take an insane status effect. These are actually, I mean, you don't want them because it means you're you're halfway to, to being in big trouble. But they're kind of neat because they have an effect on your character. I had one time where I became a kleptomaniac, so if I ended my turn in the same space as anybody else, I would try to steal items off them, which was uh, pretty fun. Uh, but again, you want to try to avoid it. Once you have that, again, if you reach your your max 8 horror, then you go completely insane. You're basically eliminated from the game. And again, the rest of the players have one round to try to finish the, um, finish the scenario. And if they don't, then they have lost. So uh, after we've done that, we'll say resolve that for everybody. Go ahead and hit continue. And then there's nothing else. So we hit that little arrow thing again. And since end the mythos phase, we're going to confirm, and we're back to the investigators. And it just proceeds like that through the whole game. Now, I've noticed in the games I've played, it can seem pretty, uh, pretty mellow early on in the scenario. You can kind of go at your own pace. But usually at some point, things kick up, and you realize, okay, now I'm on a time frame, and you have to, you have to rush through and get things done. So I kind of like that. It really cranks up the tension at the end, but it lets you... I don't know, I guess you could say sort of settle into the scenario before you get there. So hopefully that's a helpful overview for you. There's, like I said, there's there's more rules, there's more things that can happen, places can catch on fire, uh, lights can go out, which cause all sorts of different problems. But uh, the, the app actually walks you through that a lot. And I'll show you some other things about this game when I do my final thoughts that make it so you really don't necessarily have to know every single every single possible thing that could pop up in this game uh, at at the very beginning of play. Uh, that would be a lot to take in. Um, really, it's actually very easy to get a hang the hang of. I've played this with people who aren't, you know, real super serious gamers, and it's, it's pretty easy to catch on to how everything works. So I'm going to go to my final thoughts, and uh, we'll see what I thought of this game. So here are my thoughts on Mansions of Madness. Now, first, let's talk a little bit about the components. Overall, they're really excellent. Let me grab the tiles here. So the cardboard tiles that make up the mansions are all double-sided, which gives you a lot of variety in how your uh, your specific scenario can be built out. The tokens are a nice thick cardboard as, cardboard as well. Uh, the tiles are, frankly, you'd really have to work to bend these. I haven't had any of them warp so far, so I think they're fantastic. The cards, I don't know that you can really necessarily tell in the video, but they're a nice linen finish. They are the smaller 
smaller type cards. They're not full playing card size. I know some people don't like those, but they're not the type of cards or decks that you have to shuffle for the most part. The wounds and the horror decks, you might want to shuffle up just so you're not getting the same results all the time. But the, uh, the other items, you actually want to keep in alphabetical order so you can find them easily when they show up in the game. So that's nice. I know a lot of people don't like shuffling those little cards. I don't either. But you don't really have to with this game, so that's fantastic. The dice are nice. Uh, I don't usually have a complaint about dice in general. The models, um, and I've painted mine. They don't come painted. They're usually just plain gray plastic. The characters, the investigators, they're a nice, hard gray plastic. Uh, the detail's not amazing necessarily, but it's really pretty good. I've, I've had fun painting them. Um, uh, you're probably lucky you can't see these too closely because I don't know that they're painted that great, but they have been fun to paint. The monsters are a little bit of a different deal. Uh, they do look cool. I don't really have a complaint about the visuals, but there's a couple things. Um, the big black bases that they're on, and this is a larger monster, but uh, a lot of people don't like these. I've seen some people create clear bases for them, and that's fine. I actually don't for some reason, I don't even really like those as much anyway, but uh, they have their little uh, info cards about the monsters that you slide in there. And if you're trying to store these these models with the cards in them, those little, those little cards are going to fall out of there all the time. I've actually put scotch tape over the opening so that they don't come out. Uh, I wish there was some way to close that off so that way those would stay in there and I didn't have to worry about it. The monsters themselves are made out of a sort of softer plastic, and I imagine they did that for cost reasons, and, and that makes perfect sense. The game is already a pretty expensive game, so anywhere they can make it a little cheaper, that's reasonable, but it does create some problems. One, when you get them out of the box, they may be in a really odd kind of warp position. That is fixable if you're not, into, if you're not familiar with working with models. What you could do, uh, boil some water, basically dunk that model in there, for just a few seconds, pull it out, put it into the position you want, and then dunk it in cold water, and it'll firm back up and be in the position you want it to be in. Not a big deal. It'd be better if you didn't have to do it, though. The other problem that's actually somewhat bigger... So the models have these plastic nubs that go into a hole in the base in order to keep it on the base, but sometimes they're actually a little too small, and so the monster won't stay on the base at all. I've finally gotten to the point where I've just glued them all down, and some people aren't going to like to have to do that. It's you know I, I do a lot of stuff with models, so it's not that huge a deal to me, uh, but I think a lot of people are not going to like that they might have to do that to keep them on there because you don't want to have your monsters lying down on their base. It just doesn't look real cool. So um, you know that's that's something with the um, with the models. It's a little bit of an issue, depending on how comfortable you are with gluing things. It may not be that big an issue to you. So this game comes with uh, something that's pretty common for Fantasy Flight games now. It has actually two rule books. One is the uh, Learn to Play book, and that's going to have all the basic rules you need. It actually has some things that you won't necessarily even need all the time, but if you have a handle on this book, you have all you need to play. And, and frankly, even if you don't have it perfectly down, you could still get playing pretty easily with this, because as I mentioned before, I believe the app helps you through a lot of things. And if you come across any unusual cases that, that you're just not sure how to handle, there's also a rules reference that'll help clear some of those things up that you can just look through and find the specific thing you're trying to deal with, and that'll help you out. And I really like that system for Fantasy Flight. I wish more companies would do that, because it is nice to get just some basic rules so you can just jump in the game as fast as possible. And then, you know, as you come up with some stranger uh, items, you can just look those up rather than trying to remember them all from the get-go because that can be kind of challenging depending on the game. So let me talk about some positives and some negatives about this game. So on the positive side, I like games that have a lot of theme. Uh, I need a game that has at least some theme in it. It doesn't have to be really strongly integrated, but if it is, that's fantastic. And I don't think any game I've played has a theme as strongly integrated as this one. Um, I think the fact that the rules are fairly light and easy to understand in this game is fantastic because that gets out of the way of the story that you're taking part in. I think much more than a lot of the other games I've played, uh, definitely more than the other Arkham games, which are also really great and thematic, this one really, really is about the story. And so I absolutely love the theme of the game. Um, I like the look of the models. The artwork in the game is fantastic, from the tiles and the cards to the character designs. 
Everything's really great. I like that they use some of the same characters from some of their other Arkham games. So if you're familiar with them, you're going to see some familiar faces in here. Uh, I like that on the back of the character cards, they have a, a story so far. So if you're not familiar with the character, you can kind of read about it and get to, get to know what they're about. I sometimes like when I'm playing to sort of get into the character a little bit, make decisions like the character would when I'm not sure what to do myself. I don't know that always ends up in the uh, the best scenario, but it's it's fun for me to get into it a little bit. And I think the people I play with usually like to do that at least a little bit too. So that's fantastic. Not every game really has a lot of room for that. This one has tons of room for that. You could probably treat this as a full-on role-playing game if you wanted to. Uh, I like that the game... Um, has ways that your character can be affected, usually usually negatively, but uh, your character will kind of change throughout the game, especially those insanities that you can get, which, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bad, but they're really sort of fun to deal with, and I think they add to some cool stories to tell later when you're talking about the game that you had. I really, really like that kind of thing. I think you know, a part of my enjoyment as games is when you can talk about them later and say, wow, that remember that one weird thing happened. And that's fantastic. Uh, I like that although there is dice rolling, you do have the ways to mitigate luck. You can have a situation where other people are going around and they're investigating all the things that give them clue tokens and you're not having as much luck getting them. That can be kind of a bummer, but it's just not always going to go that way. So uh, that doesn't bother me too much if I don't uh, have a lot of those clue tokens. It's nice that they're there as a possible uh, possible way to handle those, those bad rolls. So beyond that, to go into some of the things that I think maybe are negatives about this game. As I mentioned, when you go into the app and you're picking your scenario, it'll tell you how long that scenario is going to last. And I know it could just be my group or the way that that we play i find that those are almost always shorter than what is accurate now it's okay sometimes you know it's it's just a big game i kind of expect it but uh it, it'd be nice if maybe it was a little little closer to to correct and i know some people probably will play this game not even really thinking about the theme that much just to plow through it and win and maybe for those people, those times are more accurate. But I also feel like that sort of misses the point of this game. I think there's a lot of games where playing that way makes total sense. I don't think this is one of them, but to each their own. Another thing uh, that's a negative I'd like to point out is with the puzzles. And I'm going to talk about one specific incident. Now, because we're talking about puzzles, it's important for me to say that this could have just been us. This could have not been a problem with the game at all. Maybe we missed something. That's certainly possible. But we were doing a logic puzzle, and it's a type of puzzle that we're usually pretty good at. I was playing with a few other people who all are very smart, good at this sort of thing, and we, for the life of us, could not get it. Even when we felt like we had everything they asked for, we felt like it was not adding up. Like, we'd put in answers that the game was not liking, even though it seemed like it should have. And eventually, we actually basically cheated. We got so aggravated, we just started putting in whatever and not worrying about how many attempts we had at doing it. And eventually, we did get an answer. And the answer didn't seem to make sense with the restrictions it was giving us either. Now, maybe we just didn't see it right. I don't know. Anything's possible. It was at the very end of the scenario, so maybe we were getting kind of mentally drained. I don't know. But to all of us, it seemed like something happened with the game. Now, that was a couple years ago. If that was ever an issue, it may be fixed now. I don't think it's common at all. I tried looking it up online, and I didn't see much, uh, much complaints about that happening to other people. So I'm kind of tentative about putting that out there. I don't want people to think that that's a rampant problem. I don't think that it is. But it did happen to us. It's something to know. Um, other negatives, if you don't like a scary theme, this, I mean, that's what this is about. It's, um, it's sort of a spinoff of their Arkham Horror game, um, horror being the, uh, the operative word there. You probably can't play this with kids, it doesn't recommend that you do anyway, but some of the descriptions of what happens can be a little unnerving. There's not graphic depictions of, depictions of gore in the game, but... 
if you're actually reading those descriptions, it can maybe be a little much for some players. Uh, I do wish that those monster models were a little higher quality plastic. I understand the need to keep them as they are for, uh, for cost sake. Um, other than that, I really don't have a lot of negatives to say about it. So with all that being said, I still want to give this game a score as far as it applies to me. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being a game that I cannot find anything negative to say about at all, and 1 being a game that just doesn't function or actually makes me angry to play, uh, 5 being the average, I'm going to give this one a 9. And I'll tell you why, because there is one thing that I want to ding in on that does kind of bother me a little bit personally, and that is the app's save feature. Now, in the app, you can save your game if you're going too long, which is very likely on some of the scenarios. And that's really cool. I'm glad they put that in there. It'll save the layout of the mansion you're in. It'll know what, what spots you have and haven't investigated. It'll know what monsters are on the board. It'll know what items have come out. And it'll know what investigators you're using. That's great. If you've saved a game and then you want to play another scenario with someone else, you can't do it. It'll erase your old game. I don't like that. I am not a programmer by any stretch. I don't know how hard it would have been, though, to allow for multiple saves. It doesn't seem like it should be that big a problem. They've been doing it since Super Nintendo days. So that's kind of weird. The other thing I don't like is that it doesn't keep in mind, and it never knows, where your characters are, where any monsters are. It doesn't know what character has what items. And I wish there was some way just to say where it says, okay, where is Wendy Adams? You poke it, and it knows where she is. Where is this monster? You poke the screen, it knows where it is. And then it would put out the items, and you could just give it to whatever person had them. And then you could look it up next time. That would be great, too. As it is, I tend to put everything together in one bag for character, and then you have to take pictures of the board so you can remember where everyone is. And if you're anything like me, your, your, phone, uh, your camera on your phone gets filled up with pictures really quick, and then going back and referencing uh, to find that specific picture and figure out where everybody was, that's kind of a pain. It's not the end of the world, but I think if those little app issues had been fixed, this would be a perfect 10, because those particular issues have annoyed me a couple times. That being said, if those issues don't sound like they would annoy you, this might be a perfect 10 for you. And make no mistake, of all the games I've played, this is in my top three for sure, and depending on the day, it might be my very favorite game. It's fantastic. Even if you don't like app-based games, I think you should give it a try. It absolutely changed my mind on apps and games. I have no problem with it now because it handles so much stuff that would get in the way of me enjoying the really cool theme of this game. I would absolutely give it a shot if you're worrying about that, uh, that high price tag. I mean, just figure out a way to play it because I think this could change your mind about that. And if that doesn't bother you at all, and the things I've said that, that are positives sound good to you, I mean, to me, this is a must-have game. I'll admit, I don't know what's going to happen if they stop supporting this game one day, or if they do a third edition. I know when they went from first to second, they actually had the ability to go into that app and tell that, that you had some of the first edition stuff. So you could still use a lot of that in the second edition game. So I imagine if they do a third edition, it'll be the same. But to be honest... If they stop supporting this tomorrow, if my app stopped working tomorrow, even though I'd be upset about it, I've gotten so much fun out of this game that, honestly, I, I wouldn't feel too bad. I mean, I've had so much variety in here with the expansions that can be added in. The game will, will uh, you'll, you'll tell the game what expansions you have, and it'll pull in tiles and monsters and all sorts of stuff from those, regardless of what scenario you're doing. I love that. I love that kind of variety. And variety is something this game has in spades. Uh, even if um, the theme stays sort of similar, what you're doing in each scenario can be very different. And I absolutely love it. So I just can't recommend this game highly enough. I mean, unless all my positives sound like negatives to you, please check it out. I don't think you'll regret it. Anyway, uh, this has been All Games New and Old. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe and click that little bell icon so you'll know when my next video is up. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time at the table. Thanks.
I'm not putting that in there. Watch, I get in there and exit. I put the same length, but it's just that over and over again somehow. <laughs> There you go, TikTok. Our TikTok. Yeah. Everyone wants to see the, <laughs> the chubby 44-year-old do that. <laughs> you know, someone out there does. Okay.